Rabbi Sroli Freed, one of the most amazing people I know, called me up one month ago and asked if I would be willing to present a community service award to our doctor, Dr. Grupp. I hung up the phone and discussed Rabbi Freed's request with my wife. We both were unsure if it was too soon to get up and talk only a few short months after the passing of our daughter, Rachel Leah, or better known to you, Dr. Grupp, as Rachel. We pondered our decision, and then we envisioned Rachel looking down from above saying to us, Dear parents, there were many times throughout my treatment that you asked me to do things that were difficult for me. I did them because you told me to do so, and I knew it was good for me. It may be hard for you to get up and speak now, but please get up and thank my favorite doctor, Dr. Grupp, to get... <laughs> together with this most incredible organization, High Lifeline, who was literally my lifeline throughout my illness. Imagine a broker who loves to play the stock market. He finds out that a certain stock went down from $60 a share to $30 a share. He invests and buys $100,000 worth of shares. The next day, the stock drops to $15 a share. Again, he invests and buys $100,000 worth of shares, thinking the stock will go back up and he would make a nice profit. The next day, the stock crashes and goes down to $0. How does such an individual feel? What thoughts cross his mind? I invested so much money, and it was all for nothing. I have a question for Dr. Grupp, a question for her lifeline, and a question for my daughter. Dr. Grupp, do you feel the same feelings as this stockbroker? You invested so much time, countless sleepless nights, and tireless efforts. Was all that hard work for nothing? I turn to you, Chai Lifeline, and I ask you a similar question. For the past five years, you devoted so much time and energy into helping our daughter and family. Do you feel like this stockbroker who ended up with nothing? Now I turn to my daughter. You went through so much pain and suffering, so many surgeries, bone marrow aspirates, chemo, radiation. Was all that for nothing? I would like to first answer for my daughter. In many hospitals, when a person battles cancer for many years and then succumbs to the illness, they refer to this individual as having lost the battle to cancer. This can't be more untrue about my daughter. You, Dr. Grubb, can testify that the last few months that Rachel was on this world and was sometimes in tremendous pain, she always tried to give you a smile always say a thank you and a please. I see Dr. Grupp smiling. We don't decide the outcome. God determines the outcome. What we can decide is how to go through these challenges. Will we take every day and use it to the fullest? Yes, Dr. Grupp, you and anyone who knew Rachel can testify that she passed this test with flying colors. That in fact, she won her battle with cancer. In a similar vein, I would like to tell you, Chai Lifeline, the outcome is not in your hands, but what is in your hands is the way you carry a cancer patient through his or her illness. Yes, you do many things, from the case managers to the hospital volunteers, from the big sisters to the counselors, from the food to the finances, from the medical referrals to the holiday parties, and the list goes on. But that is not what makes Chai Lifeline the most extraordinary organization. It's the extra mile that they go beyond their call of duty. When my wife and I wanted to be home together with the kids one night of Hanukkah, we asked our case manager, Nomi Stavsky, if someone could stay with our daughter for these few hours. Who do you think stayed with her on a Hanukkah night? Nomi Stavsky herself. The day we were leaving to Minnesota, Nami Stavsky came, took us to the airport, 
gave us food for the plane, printed out clear directions where to go when we get there. They go above and beyond their call of duty. My wife and I can honestly say, Chai Lifeline, you won this battle. Now I would like to turn to Dr. Grubb. I will start with a short story that was written in the New York Times a few months ago. The article, the article featured a picture of a mother holding her seven-year-old daughter, Emma. The title of the article says, In Girls' Last Hope, Altered Immune, immune Cells Beat Leukemia. The article goes on to say, It is hard to believe but last spring, Emma, then, was near death from leukemia. She had relapsed twice after chemotherapy, and doctors had run out of options. Desperate to save her, her parents sought an experimental treatment, one that had never been tried in a child before. The experiment used a disabled form of the virus that causes AIDS to reprogram Emma's immune system genetically to kill cancer cells. She is the first child and one of the first humans ever in whom techniques have achieved a long-sought goal, giving a patient's own immune system the lasting ability to fight cancer. She went back to school this year with her second grade classmates and is doing very well. As Dr. Grubb just told me when I was sitting down with him, this is a year anniversary from when they put in her card cells. The hospital that Emma was treated in is the, is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And the doctor who treated Emma, everyone, please rise and give a standing ovation. It was our very own doctor who is with us here tonight, Dr. Steve Grop. When we told Dr. Grupp how exciting it was for us to see him on the front page of the New York Times, he humbly responded, I don't care to be printed up in the paper. I just wish I can heal many more children like this one. Anyone who reads about Dr. Grupp knows that he is the Director of Translational Research, Center of Childhood Cancer Research at the Children's Hospital Philadelphia, Medical Director, Stem Cell Laboratory, Professor of Pediatrics, Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and Chair, Stem Cell Transplant Discipline, National Children's Oncology Group. Dr. Grupp. Your expertise and your brilliance in researching new treatments are known throughout the medical world. However, in my humble opinion, what makes you a cut above all other doctors is the way you relate to the patients in your care. There were many days when we came to the hospital when it wasn't your official day at the clinic. Rachel wanted very much to see you. You were across the street and we emailed you if maybe you can come over. You took out time from your busy schedule to come over to see what's going on. Rachel would ask you, do I still have to take Leviquin? You responded, no Rachel. That one you can stop. You always asked her before you left the room, Rachel, do you have any more questions? You made yourself very available by email or by phone. Before one of our phone calls, my wife and I wrote down five questions we wanted to discuss with you. When you picked up the phone, I said, Dr. Grupp, I hope it's okay. I have five questions to ask you. Your response was, that's it? I remember the time when she was finishing her card cell therapy in shop and you and I knew it wasn't working for Rachel. The standard procedure in hospitals is that before a patient starts therapy, a bone marrow aspirin is done to check the level of disease to determine how much leukemia is in the bone marrow. After finishing the therapy, the hospital does a second bone marrow aspirin to find out what the therapy accomplished. Dr. Grubb. You knew that wherever Rachel will start her next treatment, they will have to do another bone marrow aspirate before they get started. So why put Rachel through two bone marrow aspirates? So you advised us to go to the next center to get the bone marrow done, and you would get the results from them. Dr. Grubb doesn't lose sight of the pain and discomfort of his patients while treating them. You see from this episode that Dr. Grubb considers the patient a person, 
and not just another number. Dr. Grubb sent us an email after Rachel's passing and I quote, I am so sorry that this happened, so sorry for your loss, and so sorry that Rachel is no longer with us. I was due in Minneapolis for a meeting in April, and I had this picture in my mind of being able to drop by the hospital and see that she was doing well. Once your patient, always your patient, even if she had to go to another hospital for a different treatment. Dr. Grupp, we can't determine the outcome, but we can decide how to deal with the situation. And in that, you passed your test. You won the battle with cancer. In closing, I would like to read a small poem that my wife and I think, if Rachel would be here presenting this honor to Dr. Grupp, this is what she would say. Dear Dr. Grupp, this is Rachel looking down from up high. Sorry, Dr. Grupp, to you I never said goodbye. My last few months, you tended to my care. From all the doctors I met, to you no one did compare. You're a cut above with great expertise, yet to me so humbly, you came down with such ease. Day after day with so much empathy and insight, caring for my frail body through many sleepless nights. Dr. Grupp, you're a doctor that everyone adores. You should have only health and joy for you and yours. May you continue being the dedicated healer that you are with the special touch that reaches so far. Though my own recovery was not meant to be, your devotion to its cause touched both my parents and me. I can think of no one deserving this honor more than you. So please rise, Dr. Grupp, and accept this award for all that you do.